Welcome back, motorized bike enthusiast. In today's episode of Porting and Performance, we deck the head for a tighter squish cap, cut our own custom port timings, see if the deluxe pipe, aka the WC80, does anything, run some more head-to-head -head tests, which yield good results, and show you where to find some great information about two-stroke port timing. Our main goal in this episode is to give you all the basic information you need to try your own custom modifications, while staying within safe motor limitations. We will eventually be pushing into less safe territory, but for now, I want to focus on practical performance improvements that won't drastically decrease the life of your motor. Although I have played around with some basic port work over the past few years and had good results, I'm not an expert. I can only show you the results I get and how I got them. As this series grows, we'll learn together, to the point that basic port work knowledge will be as commonly known as choosing the right spark plug or changing a flat tire. I will be offering up what I feel to be some relatively safe numbers that most builders will be able to enjoy, but I'm more focused on teaching you how to fish rather than just giving you a fish and calling myself an expert. With that being said, I will of course be going over the timings I decided to go with and why, along with the results I obtained. For better or worse, with a failure or a victory, I will show you nothing in this series unless I can back it up with head-to-head -head results and real-world numbers. Giving credit where credit is due, along with the linked sites in the description, I'd like to give a big shout out and thank you to Two Stroke Stuffing for all the hard work, tips, and tricks he's put into the community for years. If anyone can call themselves an expert, it's this man as he literally builds his own motors from the ground up and shows real world results without any of the drama. In part one, linked in the description, I showed you the process I used to obtain the stock port timings on our Firestorm. Here we will be using the same process to mark our new target numbers, so if you need a refresher, be sure to check it out. The first modification we'll start with is improving our squish gap. This should be done before making any final measurements for your cut. Our Firestorm motor came with two base gaskets. This slightly increases the exhaust and transfer duration, which should help improve top speed, but as a side effect, it decreases compression and increases the squish gap beyond what many consider to be acceptable limits. If your build would benefit more from low end torque and top speed is not a main concern, you could remove one base gasket to help eliminate most of this process. Whether it's for low or high RPM power, the squish is still important, so if you find yours is wider than 1mm or tighter than 0.5mm, this should be addressed. This process can be manipulated with different base and head gasket thicknesses, but if you find yourself in our situation where the cylinder simply has too much material, then here's how I dealt with it. I first checked the gap with standard 1mm solder by pushing it against the cylinder wall and rotating the motor. When I found it wasn't getting a reading, I then folded the solder onto itself a few times, ensuring that it could still get a reading even if it was to rotate during the test. I found that our squish was over 2 millimeters, so I knew I could safely remove 1 millimeter. Using the depth gauge on my caliper, I marked a 1 millimeter no-go line, then proceeded to remove the bulk of the material with 60 grit on a hard flat surface. This process took about an hour. I also added a few dots to each side of the deck so I could judge how aggressively material was being removed. During this process, I made sure to rotate the jug in order to keep the deck as flat as possible. With just a sliver of material left, I rechecked the squish gap without the head gasket in place. This gave us a better picture of what we were still working with. After adding our gap to the thickness of available head gaskets, I could see we were right where we wanted to be. I then took the head and jug out onto a glass table to be faced with light pressure on 600, 1000, and finally 2000 grit sandpaper. Keeping your sand wet during the facing process helps prevent material from building up and causing high spots. By the time we were done we had a mirror smooth finish that would seal perfectly. Using my thinner brass head gasket I found that our squish was a bit on the tight side. I have a thicker aluminum one I can use to widen the gap if needed but for now we'll test this one out. Having a gap this tight may be fine and possibly even optimal for motors that stay around the 7000 RPM limit but I suspect that we're soon going to need to widen the gap as by the end of this video the motor's pushing around 8000. I also believe a gap this tight may benefit from, if not require, higher octane fuel, but for now we're still testing on 87. On to the ports. 
As I begin to make modifications that are greatly impacted by certain aspects of the motor's design, I'll be sure to cover them in detail to the best of my knowledge. But there are far too many things going on in the background of these little motors to cover in one video, so for now we are just going to focus on some simple port adjustments and what you can expect in terms of performance. I'll leave a few links in the description if you'd like to get a head start on what's to come in future episodes. What you are about to hear is an oversimplification of a two-stroke, but in general, longer port duration will move the motor's RPM limit higher. If left unchecked, this will sacrifice low RPM power, but there are a few tricks the community has found to help lessen the sacrifice. You will also see later in the episode that without a decent pipe, it will be more difficult for this small displacement motor to have enough power to even reach higher RPMs. I'm not ashamed to admit that at the moment I'm unsure as to what has a greater impact on RPM limits and RPM peak power, the pipe or the ports. I assume they work in harmony, with longer port duration having potential for higher RPMs and the pipe giving the added boost needed to reach the desired RPMs. I've been fortunate enough to have a bunch of different cylinders on hand including the Phantom 85. When comparing the performance and port times of these different jugs along with online resources, I found that our main limiting factor is going to be the transfer ports. With my current available tooling, it will be difficult to get the desired transfer duration while maintaining a consistent roof angle, both of which are important. We will revisit the transfers later on in the series when we have better tooling, so for now we'll focus on the exhaust and intake. Starting with the intake, I decided to drop the floor to get a duration of 120 degrees. This should make up for the 1mm loss we had with the added base gasket. On every motor I have ever worked on, lowering the intake floor by 1mm has always helped top in performance without any noticeable sacrifice in the low end. And in this area, experiments are rather safe due to the fact that most mistakes can be bypassed by adding a reed valve, which we plan on doing later anyways. In the past I've played around with skirting the piston to obtain the same results, but at the time I never gave much thought to how this might affect balance. I never noticed any negative effects, but I was also not trying to push the motor to its limits, so keep that in mind. Once we start testing bigger carburetors, we will see how much a wider intake port will affect performance, but for now we're going to leave it as is. Marty's Garage gives us a simple equation that helps balance our exhaust duration with our transfer duration for a target RPM range. And I think they're onto something because these equations match the Phantom 85's port map perfectly, and that thing was a beast. It also matches the well-machined G4 cylinder's stock port timing. This helps reinforce our information in episode 2 that stated the designers of these motors knew what they were doing, only their target RPM range was a bit lower to maintain reliability and practicality. For now, I'll raise the exhaust port to 160 degrees, which will increase our blowdown to 24 degrees, so we can try to reach a decent balance for 8,000 RPMs. This blowdown may be a bit high and our transfer is still too low, but once I upgrade my tooling, I'll play around with raising the transfers and adjusting the roof angle in such a way that will either turn this jug into a diamond or a doorstop. Another well-known technique to increase power in any given RPM range is to simply widen the exhaust port. The intake port is well, so I've heard, but I haven't messed around with it yet, so I can't confirm will do that in future episodes. But widening the exhaust port will increase your blowdown's effective area, and you can do this without messing with your timing. So if you're a little nervous about moving the actual timing of your ports, you can simply widen the exhaust port to 70% of its bore diameter, which ends up being just under 33 millimeters. For me, I went to about 32 millimeters. This has another benefit as well, as it doesn't affect your motor's true displacement. Everything above the exhaust port is your motor's actual displacement. It's the chamber that holds the mixture. As you raise your exhaust port, you actually decrease the true displacement of your motor. Now this is usually negated with adding a pipe and doing other various techniques with the port work, but just keep that in mind. The more area you have above the exhaust, the more true displacement your motor has. We'll move on to some head-to-head -head test here in just a moment. For now, I'll put the stock port timings along with the timings we arrived at up on the screen and in the description so we can reference them for future videos to see what kind of improvements we make, if any. Throughout this series, we're undoubtedly going to make some door stops, as we're going into a lot of this blind. And although I'm happy with the results I got on this cylinder so far, I think there's definitely a lot of room for improvement. 
I have a handful of cylinders I'll be testing different timings on, and once we arrive at something I feel safe for most G4 cylinders that you can use, I'll go ahead and have a dedicated video showing my cutting techniques along with the tools I used and what numbers we arrived at. Okay, let's get on with the test. I've got six pulls for you. The first three are with the MZ65 clone and the new port timings, and the last three will be with the deluxe pipe from Bikeberry. It's the same as the WC80 with the new port timings. After we do three runs each, we'll compare our times to last week's episode to see what kind of improvements we got. We're doing the same thing we did last time with the 15.5 mile an hour to 30 mile an hour pulls. We're also throwing in the 15.5 to 25 mile an hour times. And I may need to adjust these parameters as the series progresses, as the bike is now going faster, and they may not be as relevant. But for now, this is what we got.
Okay, the results are in, and this is pretty interesting. As a refresher, on the top left is our last week's average results with the MZ65 clone on the stock port timings. There's the 15 to 25, 7.2, 15 to 30, 12.3, and a top speed of 35 miles an hour. With the same pipe on our new port timings, we see an improvement all around. Better acceleration and a higher top speed. This is what I was going for. However, if I'm completely honest, I was expecting a little bit more. The 15 to 30 is pretty nice. We knocked two seconds off of that, and having an extra two miles an hour is always a good thing. So all in all, it is an improvement. But I'm still new at this, and we have a long ways to go, because currently, my cuts were not very aggressive. We we're just playing it safe, you know, practical performance for now. But we're going to take this much further. And I also suspect that we're at a carburetor limitation, but don't worry, we got that covered. We got a lot of carburetors to test. Now the interesting results are when we added the deluxe pipe, the WC80, exact same pipe. I put them side by side, same pipe, same crappy welds, bigger expansion chamber, shorter header. And the results kind of reflect what you would expect to see, a higher top speed, however I wasn't expecting acceleration to take such a dive. I didn't really notice this when I was on the bike, but the numbers don't lie. Our 15 to 25, our 15 to 30 are quite a bit lower than the MZ65 clone, but our top speed is a good bit higher. 40 miles an hour, it's faster than I really want to be going on a bike, but I do this for you guys. Anyways, in a nutshell, if you're looking for more practical, low-end power, the MZ65 clone appears to still have a place on the market. But if you're a speed demon going for top speed, take a look at the Deluxe, and I'm curious to see just how far we can take this. Maybe 45? We'll see how it goes. Anyways guys, I hope you enjoyed today's video and got some useful information. And until next time, ride safe.